My name is Daniela Labate, and I'm with NIAPRIS. Um, I will be joined today by Eve Addis uh, for a presentation on how to craft a value proposition. Oh, my slides are not advancing. Okay. So before we get started, I just need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the MCTAC website. Any questions that are not answered today will be reviewed and we'll get back to you individually via email. So MCTAC is a training, consultation, and educational resource center that offers resources to both mental health and substance use providers throughout New York State. And MCTAC's goal <clears throat> is to assist providers, uh, prepare and assist providers with the transition to Medicaid managed care. So here is our CTAC and MCTAC partner slide. You can see all of the partners there and the Small Business Initiative Partners. And the Small Business Initiative is a group of partners that work specifically with providers who are new to billing Medicaid or have less experience billing Medicaid to help them in the transition um, to managed care. So before I go through the agenda for today's webinar, I want to encourage you to use the chat box to type in your questions um, throughout the presentation. Please type in your questions to all panelists. Uh, we'll be keeping track of your questions, and we've set aside about 10 minutes at the end um, for Q&A. So please do chat in your questions as they come up. And I also wanted to tell you a little bit about Eve Addis, our presenter today. Eve is a consultant. Um, he's got a long history of working in outpatient mental health, and one of his areas of expertise is crafting value propositions. So we are pleased to have him with us today. So thank you, Eve, for joining us, and welcome. And I just want to walk you briefly through today's agenda. So the goals of today's webinar are to help you frame the idea of value for your organization in a managed care environment. We'll also be presenting on the elements um, that are part of a strong value proposition. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Eve, who is going to get us started. Eve, is your phone muted? You can't hear me? Now we can hear Hello? you. Thank you. Oh, sorry yeah, about that. Now. Okay. What I wanted to say was that uh, I'm hoping that one of the takeaways of, uh, of today's webinar is to get you all to start thinking about the value of what you do in the context of health system transformation and reform and Medicaid managed care. So, you know, there's a, this, this webinar is full of information, but it's really to stimulate, uh, more to stimulate your thinking about how to define the value that you bring uh, to this change, this big change that we're all facing. Um, okay, so uh, value is in the eyes of the beholder. This is a take uh, off on beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And what I mean by, what we mean by this is that value means different things to different stakeholders. Uh, defining your value uh, it becomes really a charge of uh, thinking about it in terms of how meaningful it is with regards to your target audience. For example, uh, if we look at your clients, uh, value would be uh, being treated with respect in a friendly environment that feels safe. So think about the target audience when you think about the value that you bring. So the beholders here are you, your organization, uh, the people you serve, your payers, which in this case mainly are the managed care organization, healthcare system objectives, and, and this is really uh, the overriding triple aim of the healthcare transformation, and your potential partners, uh, which include if any of you are involved in uh, the PPSs around DISRIP. Um, Keep in mind here that there is an initiative underway uh, called the Behavioral Health uh, Care Collaborative, uh, and uh, there's an RFP out. So the state is incentivizing the development of partnerships through this RFP. And we believe that having a value proposition worked out is a good way to summarize what each potential partner is bringing to the collaboration table. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the properties of a sound value proposition here, uh, you have to be consistent with your agency's mission. 
And uh, you have to meet the expectations of uh, the people who need and come to you for services, uh, the MCOs who will pay you to deliver the services to their members, again, the state's triple aim in healthcare transformation, and your potential partners. Next. Okay, so um, let's look at the triple aim because I think that uh, looking at value through this lens uh, is important as a starting point. Uh, so the, the, your value now kind of gets uh, sort of looked at through how you improve the experience of care, uh, how you improve the health of population, and how, as a result of improving the experience of care and improving the health of populations, the cost of care is reduced. So think about value from these three perspectives of quality, experience, quality, and cost. So where do you find value? Okay, so if you think about mission, which is what you do, uh, you have to think about where the value is and what you do according to some of what we've already talked about. The value in how you do what you do, which is your practice. So uh, again, we're talking here about not only what you do, but the, the method, the, the practice, the philosophy, et cetera. And the outcomes, which really is why you keep doing something, because presumably you believe that it does, it has some impact. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about outcomes um, uh, as we move forward. So, Eve, let me ask you a question. What if I'm not sure what my outcomes are? Well, most people, you know, uh, do have outcomes. Uh, they may, they, they'll get, there's going to be great variation in how people uh, sort of track outcomes, how people uh, measure outcomes. Uh, so for just for now, uh, think about, uh, the results of what you do. So think about how uh, the work that you do, whether uh, you do clinic work or you do prose work or you have an ACT team or you do um, uh, housing, uh, whatever it is, outreach, whatever it is that you do, think about um, uh, the, the outcomes at this point on how, the, how those services affect uh, the populations you serve. Uh, it's much more complicated once you start to talk about how to how to track outcomes and how to measure. But right now, let's just let's just think about what you think your outcomes are based on your own experience. Okay, that's helpful. So let's move into mission a little bit, or the 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 what you do, right? So your mission should be consisting of what behavioral health services you provide who you provide those services to and to what end. And we want to make a distinction here between services and programs. Um, by that I mean focus on the specific services and who you're providing those services to. What specific population are you working with that's receiving those services and to what end? So I'm going to show you an example now of the what you do, right? So. Acme Behavioral Health provides recovery-oriented housing, employment, and peer support services to individuals with mental health and addictive disorders that serve to promote good health and greater participation in community life. So the what is the recovery-oriented housing, employment, and peer support services. The who is the individuals with mental health and substance use disorder diagnoses. And the to what end is to promote good health and greater participation in the community. So you might ask, why are we talking about health? Right, and uh, you know, we've really gotten to a place, I think, in the last four years where uh, we're no longer operating in silos where, you know, we have behavioral health providers on one end and we have primary care providers on the other. Uh, we really have to kind of integrate. Um, and to the, to the extent that uh, social determinants of health uh, have become really very important and and across the board, you know, I think it, it's finally been realized that, you know, there's more to good health than a visit to the primary care physician's office. Uh, that good health uh, really comes from and depends on a lot of social factors. 
So uh, you are basic, basically all of the people, I think, tuning into this uh, as social service behavioral health providers. You are in the healthcare business. And I think you have to remember that. And, you know, I've worked with a number of, of providers, and, you know, health doesn't appear in their mission statements. And I think that uh, it's time that uh, when you talk about your impact, uh, when you talk about that last part of the – can you go back a slide, uh, Daniela? Uh, when you go back to that um, to what end piece uh, of promote good health and greater participation in community life, it's important that health uh, be there uh, because people who are looking at and reading about your mission need to know that you're concerned with, you know, the total human being, including uh, while you might not perform medical procedures, you are still uh, uh, engaging people in uh, adopting healthy behaviors. Okay. We could move on. All right. So, as Daniela just said, uh, when you're talking about uh, what you do, uh, talk about services. You know, don't talk about your programs. Your programs are important, but for the sake of uh, sort of expressing your value, you want your stakeholders. Uh, to know uh, what your services are, your discrete services, what you deliver. Uh, and then when you talk about your population, I know that in the example I gave, you know, we gave two broad categories of people with, with mental health uh, disorders and addiction. Uh, but there's, a, there's an even finer way to kind of looking at your population. I know that at a number of webinars and talks that I've been to, people really stress this. Who do you serve? And you really need to focus in on that. It's, it's, it's really very specific uh, in terms of segmenting the larger population into specific subcategories. So based on diagnosis, perhaps, of age, of chronic illness. Uh, so you want to get at a, a finer way of looking at the populations you serve, particularly uh, when we're talking, uh, when, when so much of what's happening uh, in our system and so many of the changes in the innovation have to do with addressing complex care and people with high risk, uh, high need. And then lastly, uh, demonstrate the impact, a result of delivering your services to the people who, who receive them. So um, again, this is, this is based on the outcomes, but again, you can't really um, have a value proposition if you don't have some way of indicating the impact of what you do. Okay, so here are some examples of sort of how we can break down the population of folks that you serve um, or that you provide services to. Are the people that you provide services to, um, are, are you addressing their specific needs? For example, do you deal um, with men and women who are over age 65 who both have a psychiatric diagnosis and a, a chronic health condition. So here are just some more examples. You can break down um, your population by age, gender, psychiatric diagnosis, if there's a substance use disorder, a comorbid health condition. Um, we want you to think in terms of specifics and what sets your services apart from other people's services. Is there a specific age range of folks that you provide services to? Um, or any sort of specialty sort of in that area. And then once you've done that and you kind of have broken it down as much as possible, uh, you want to kind of look at which of those population segments represent the highest risk. And risk here is really defined mostly in terms of people who are at the highest risk for getting sicker, at the highest risk for dropping out of care, at the highest risk for using uh, expensive institutional-based services like emergency rooms and hospitals. Um, then you want to know uh, which of those populations, again, the ones that I just described, are the managed care plans most concerned about. Managed care plans are responsible for keeping people healthy. And so there are going to be groups of people, of members that, they, that, that are their members that they're going to be concerned about because they don't have the capacity to manage as well as they'd like to. And then 
for you is, is to kind of match up of the services or interventions that you provide, uh, which ones uh, have do a better job of managing the risk of the populations that you've identified. So you may have an intervention that works very well for, you know, 18 to 24-year-olds uh, with schizophrenia and an addiction, uh, and you may have another intervention that will work with uh, another population segment. And so you want to know uh, what matches up, what, what, which interventions achieve the best results with which population. Next. So, for example, you know, and this is this I pulled out of some uh, some SAMHSA readings that I did and some other webinars and and talks that I went to. But managed care organizations, for example, are interested in in these kinds of of, of populations and issues. So, people with mental health and addictive disorders, uh, 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 and co and I'm sorry, people with mental health and addictive disorder comorbidities increase average health care costs by 200% and increase hospital admissions by 300%. So this is a population that if you're serving, that's going to be a very uh, important population uh, in terms of value, the value you bring to the managed care organizations. Another one is uh, people with multiple chronic conditions have disproportionate ER and hospital util utilization. Uh, and this is that 20% of the Medicaid population who use 80% of Medicaid resources. So again, uh, if you're serving and if you know that you, a lot of the people that you serve uh, have multiple chronic conditions, uh, this is, uh, uh, for example, where do you have value, where do your services uh, bring value in, in terms of uh, reducing those ER and uh, hospital stays. So there is a way of kind of honing your value proposition so that it meets the needs of this stakeholder, meaning the managed care organizations, if you tune in to uh, the population that they are tuning into. Go ahead. So all this talk about value. So in summary, I think we can say that value is really applying both expertise and practice that mitigates risk for overutilization of preventable high-cost services in institutional settings. In other words, what service are you providing to improve someone's health and reduce ER and inpatient, inpatient usage? And here are some practice issues. So think about these, um, these issues or these ideas when you're, when you're operating your business, right? So, all of these are linked to better, better health outcomes. So are there services and practices that you're providing? Are they trauma-informed? Are they recovery-based? Does your direct care staff um, who's providing these services, are they trained in motivational interviewing, person-centered planning, um, any specific evidence-based practice? Does your workforce include peers? Um, does your workforce receive health literacy training? You know, do they understand what an A1C is if they're working with someone who has diabetes? Do they have a basic um, understanding of major chronic medical conditions? They don't need to be experts, but they do need to be able to communicate um, and to communicate with the person who's receiving services and really encourage them to follow up and, and get the medical attention that they need on an ongoing basis so that they're not using emergency rooms. Um, and are, this, are your services easy to access? So do you offer walk-in hours? Do you have same-day intakes, things like that? Yeah, the, the, the issue there with practice, I just want to say, is your value proposition, uh, you would actually uh, mention that. You would say things like, um, you know, that you use these interventions, that, you're, that, that health literacy is an important part of, the pra of your practice. These are all elements that uh, when one is thinking about either partnering or, or contracting with an organization, uh, they want to make sure that uh, the organization is up to, up to speed on best practices, is up to speed on training, and that has a workforce that will be able to deliver uh, the, the outcomes uh, for the populations in question. So this slide really is a visual which really speaks to, you know, that value exists um, at the intersection of how your practice impacts uh, uh, 
positive health outcomes in your targeted population. So you, you've got your population segments who you serve, uh, you've got your practice, which is what you do, and, and then your impact in how uh, your practice uh, applied to the population segment has a result or an impact that improves health outcomes for that population segment. And this is what you can change and measure. This is what you actually then say, this is what we do and this is what is, this is the result. Next. Okay. So the big question comes now, which is, uh, you know, what what do we measure in terms of in terms of um, our value? And it's not it's not only impact. Uh, we've been talking about impact up until this point, but it's also the quality. You can measure the quality of services. You can measure process. Those things that you do that actually uh, you're not looking at their effect, but you're looking at processes that have been linked to positive health outcomes. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, uh, screening uh, for uh, certain kinds of um, uh, uh, disease, uh, where, which is not necessarily, or having on your questionnaires uh, questions about people's uh, chronic health and, and being able to address that, that's a process that simply engaging somebody on that level is an important part and an important determinant of of uh, of good health uh, performance. And you know this is this is a, gets a little bit more technical, but it gives you the sense of it. It addresses what 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 how your staff uh, how your programs perform. Go ahead. Next. Okay, so let's look at quality and process for a second. Um, process measures a given indication of how well the program functions internally and how well it is adhering to improving population health. So, for example, a process here would be how you monitor adherence to antipsychotic medication for people with schizophrenia. We're not looking at what the impact is, but we're looking at that this is something that you do and that there is evidence to show that if, 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 if adherence to antipsychotic medications occurs, uh, presumably symptoms will be reduced. Same thing for antidepressant medication, uh, how it's managed. If you do that, that that's valuable and it's important to, to express that. Uh, diabetes monitoring, particularly for people with schizophrenia. Uh, is your staff, does, it, does your staff have the literacy to be able to engage in conversations about uh, going, to the regu going to the doctor regularly, uh, having blood sugar tested regularly for people with diabetes? Uh, another important one is, um, you know, post-hospitalization follow-up for psychiatric admission. Uh, this is important to prevent readmissions to the hospital that are preventable and avoidable if, if there is some follow-up after discharge. And, you know, bridger level of care, which is sort of an example of a model uh, that, that manages these transitions. So again, uh, this is process and it, it's, it's a kind of, of, uh, of, of internal mechanisms that uh, are, are, of good, are of high quality. So here we have some more examples of quality and process measures, things like same-day access or crisis support, um, looking at rates of engagement and retention and service utilization. So are the folks that you're engaging into treatment staying in treatment? Um, are they keeping, you know, are they keeping appointments and receiving the services that they've signed on for? Um, are they using services appropriately? Um, are they happy with the services that they're receiving? So looking at participant satisfaction. Most providers have some measure of participant satisfaction. Um, you may do a survey. And then the question is, what do you do afterwards, right? Does, so does the feedback that you receive, does that um, lead to any changes in service provision? Um, so all of these examples are things that you can measure that will help you sort of, quote, unquote, prove or help you state your value.
Okay, so now looking at performance and impact, um, so this is, I know that people are going to be in very different places around um, having capacity to collect this kind of outcome data and, and also being able to track it and measure. Uh, but, you know, treatment response would be an impact. Uh, it would be sort of a function of symptom management, health status. Uh, hospital inpatient emergency room use for behavioral health and what are called ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So, you know, for this kind of thing, you would have to be able to collect baseline data before you uh, effected an intervention, and then you would measure again, and you would see if, if that intervention has actually resulted in a reduction in emergency room use uh, or hospital use. Uh, you can also look at readmissions within 30 days uh, for both behavioral health and comorbid chronic conditions. Again, a baseline being able to have some sense of prior to the, an intervention, then, uh, uh, you know, intervening in, in some meaningful way and then looking at whether that intervention had an impact and, in fact, were readmissions decreased. Emergency room diversion uh, through same-day access crisis management. Uh, so uh, here again, baseline uh, intervention, which would be the same-day access, uh, crisis intervention, and then hopefully a reduction in the need to go to emergency room. Uh, another very important one at this point in terms of our uh, evolution in healthcare is the degree to which uh, your staff are able to refer and engage people uh, in uh, joining health homes and participating in HCBS. Uh, again, this is something you can measure every time one of your staff uh, engages somebody in, in going uh, and becoming a member of a health home or uh, signing up for an HCBS service, that counts as uh, value, uh, that you're bringing value to the table. And then any time you participate or, or, uh, or have an effect on people, improving people's housing, getting people jobs, uh, improving any way a person's quality of life, both social determinants of health, uh, being able to count that, being able to measure that. Uh, and then lastly, engagement and retention in care. There are lots of people out there who don't engage well in traditional uh, services and the degree to which the kinds of services you provide can keep people in care and hence keep them healthy becomes an important uh, measure of your value. Okay, so, so here's a nice summary of um, the ideas of value through the lens of the, the triple aim. So if you think of a target, right, and you have a bullseye at the center, that's the improve the experience of care bullseye, right? How do your services engage high-risk individuals in care that results in the adoption of healthy behaviors? And then this coming out of that, that bullseye of, or the center is the idea of improving overall population health. So looking at your services and your practice and how that positively impacts the health of, of these populations that you're serving. And then finally, if you can do both of those things, um, then you'll find sort of a, a naturally reduced cost associated with serving these individuals. So how do the services um, that you're providing keep people in community-based care as opposed to overusing ERs and hospitals? Um, so speaking of cost, it's important to know your cost formula. How much does it cost um, for you to provide these services that result in really good outcomes? So this, is, this gets to a, sort of a level of uh, I don't expect that people are going to kind of get to this right away, but it's something to think about because you need to know in terms of value, you need to know what those high-cost interventions uh, uh, cost, <laughs> and then and then what your interventions cost. And basically, if your your intervention succeeding in preventing the use of those high-cost services uh, saves money, uh, and and managed care organizations are willing uh, to 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 engage and to subcontract with providers who can deliver effective services 
at a at a decent cost, at, at the right cost, uh, that of course will be less than what the uh, high cost services are uh, to to result in in saving. So um, at some point, everybody I think uh, is going to have to kind of do some really a, a deep dive into what does it actually cost me to deliver whatever intervention I'm delivering. So this is a moment in time where um, you are also, in addition to looking at what you're already providing and the value in what you're already providing, as we've been talking, uh, also think about uh, the opportunities now that you have to innovate value. So this is, this is where you look at what you're doing and you look at the populations that you serve and maybe think about things that you could be doing or things that you've been thinking of doing, but, you know, you needed to get some funding or some grant in order to do it. There's opportunity now to kind of test those models, to pilot those models uh, that may ultimately bring a lot of value uh, to your work. Uh, so, you know, I've heard people talk about the next generation of value as you know, uh, could we have behavioral health urgent care uh, instead of, you know, there are lots of uh, kind of physical uh, primary care urgent care out there. Uh, what about behavioral health urgent care to prevent those visits to the ER? Uh, specialty telehealth, this is a very, very big and burgeoning uh, industry now, especially in more rural areas where uh, access to services can be uh, daunting. Uh, High intensity transition services. Uh, so those are for, you know, the folks who uh, are, you know, what we used to call the revolving door, people that, you know, just go from, from institutional setting to institutional setting. Uh, you know, and this is not new actually because, um, you know, ACT teams in effect are, do provide this high intensity uh, service, but could there be other kinds of variations on that theme? Uh, Home-based crisis uh, stabilization. Um, uh, this is this is something that I think people are already exploring to uh, prevent unnecessary uh, 911 and to do some really uh, good ER diversion. And then on-call fear recovery specialists. So this is kind of a uh, you know using the the effectiveness of of peers. Uh, in a way where uh, people can call in uh, and speak to a peer at a time of crisis uh, that may mitigate that visit to the ER. So, look, this list could be, you know, four slides worth, but just to get you thinking about uh, really creatively uh, what other things can you do to, that would add value to the work you're already doing. And I think this is a good place to start a conversation about all of the innovative services that folks provide out there that are not necessarily being reimbursed by Medicaid. Um, we want you to be able to sort of think outside the box and, and look at the services that you're providing that you're not getting paid for, but that are really valuable. So Eve, maybe you can speak a little bit about how they can um, sort of present those innovations to stakeholders. Yeah, you know, I I think this is that once you you know you, once you can have a conversation with a managed care organization, whether it's because you are already uh, providing HCBS services and you have relationships uh, with managed care organizations, or you know, based on your clinic work, uh, but that these conversations, and certainly, let me also say that you know, in 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 the district uh, world. Uh, around solving, you know, community pro you know, engaging in those community projects uh, uh, that I know that a lot of providers are bringing uh, innovation into those conversations. So the, 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 the managed care organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, I know have been uh, funding pilots uh, you know, I've sat in on a number of panels uh, with the MCOs, and uh, they've all indicated that they're interested in hearing about ideas uh, to solve specific population health issues. Uh, and I know, uh, you know, having worked most of my life uh, in, the, in the provider sector, how many times 
you know, we sat around and, and we, we actually put things together that, you know, we never got paid for, but we did it and it worked. Uh, and now there's an opportunity to get to get paid, and there's an opportunity to get paid to do a pilot uh, if you have an idea. And this is this is sort of taking this idea of the value of what I have as an organization and building on it. Uh, and uh, there is there there is an interest now in in good ideas uh, that solve difficult problems. Okay, next. Okay, sorry folks, I had a little trouble advancing that slide. Okay, so here's your template for a strong value proposition. You're gonna start with a mission statement or the, the what we do equivalent as we call it, right? Then you're gonna talk about, you're gonna make sure that you're including your services. What, so what are the specific services? Remember we're talking services, not programs um, that you provide. And who are you providing those services to? And you're going to pay special attention to um, specific parts of your population, whether that's, you know, looking at a certain age group or gender or specific diagnosis. And then you're going to talk about your approach. So what best practices might you follow? What's your, your philosophy? Um, and then finally, put some outcomes in there because we, you need to demonstrate that your services have impact. So whether that outcome is... Um, reducing an ER utilization or since you started in, um, implementing a certain type of treatment approach, maybe your ER utilization has gone down for a specific part of your population. So really think about um, what you're doing, who you're working with, how you're working with them, and then what that, that health outcome is. Um, so we think that's basically the template for a really strong um, value proposition. Eve, did you want to add anything else in this slide? But just that you want to keep it kind of really succinct and brief and pointed. Uh, you don't want, um, you know, you, you, you really want to, if you can, fit it all on one page. Uh, and this is something that you would uh, use uh, when you go to networking events, uh, when you, uh, you would send them to potential partners when you meet with managed care organizations, in a, in a one page, that uh, entity that you're communicating with should get a very strong sense of, of, of you and of the value that you bring based on these, um, uh, these elements. Uh, so uh, I think Daniela now is going to tell you uh, sort of what the part two of this is going to be. I am, but before I do that, I just wanted to piggyback off of something you said. So I think it's it's important to sort of say, try to keep it to a one-pager. Um, people tend to get excited about all the services they're offering and, and everything that they're doing, but things can tend to get a little lengthy, um, and you want to be able to keep people's attentions. And then also, once you create one value proposition, you can sort of tweak it based on the audience that you're you're presenting your value proposition to, right? Yes, uh, oh. exactly, and, and 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 I think that it's important to to keep that in mind as you're putting these together. Who is the audience? What are they interested in hearing? Uh, and to emphasize those things, it's not that you're going to be making things up that aren't true. It's just that you're going to uh, really point out more strongly the things that uh, that that entity that you're speaking with, that you're conversing with. Uh, it, it, it wants to see, that that's going to be meaningful for them. Exactly. So with that in mind, we are um, going to sort of give you a little intro, an introduction to part two. <laughs> so um, before we take questions, so there is a follow-up to this webinar. We are doing some in-person trainings um, or workshops, rather, throughout the state. Um, everyone who registered for today's webinar will receive an email with a tip sheet from me, and that tip sheet is sort of your, your Cliff's Notes version of today's webinar um, and what we think the um, properties of a strong value proposition are. And we want you to take that tip sheet and we want you to work on creating your own value proposition. Um, and then we want you to register for these in-person workshops and we want you to bring those value proposition drafts with you and we're going to spend time working with folks um, to really um, sort of hone them and edit them and polish them um, and basically, and also share, share your ideas with folks, you know, 
good work happens in groups, um, and what you've you know included in your value proposition may be a really good idea for someone else who provides similar services to you, also to include in their value proposition. Um, you know, we tend to sort of learn from each other. So we do encourage you um, to register for these these half day in person workshops. We're going to be in the Hudson Valley, Albany. Batavia, Buffalo, Long Island, and New York City, um, and you can register at ctechny.org um, for some, uh, you'll get the times and each, uh, you know, I lost my train of thought. You'll get the times for each of the, um, the workshops in each of the areas. Okay, so okay. Dave, if you have, Danielle. go ahead. This was a pleasure working with you, Daniela. It's not over yet. We still have to get to the questions and answers. We still have some time. <laughs> You're not okay. off the hook yet. <laughs> okay. So we did get a couple of questions. Um, I see that we got some folks typing questions in during the presentation. So I'm just going to take a quick uh, minute here to go through those and load them up. Okay. So if you have any more questions, feel free to type them in. Um, like I said, we've got some questions. So the first one is, Eve, are there samples of value propositions that you have that we could look at? <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask that question. Yeah. I, I, well, let me say this. You know, uh, I, I pref what happens is, is that if, 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 um, if a sample is provided, I really think it stunts creativity because I think what people do is they sort of just, they all start looking alike. So that's why we've taken this approach where we're going to give you kind of a, of, a, of a template, if you will, for lack of a better word. And then we want you to do it yourself. And, and, and then if you come to the workshop, you know, we'll help you to polish it up and you'll also be able to hear what other people in the room um, are doing. And so you'll get a lot of ideas that way. Uh, but, but I'd rather not give an example because then I've done this, and what happens is they all start uh, looking exactly the same. So, so I invite you and, and urge you to come to the workshops. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense because we don't want them to be cookie cutter. We really want you to be able to express the specific value that you bring to the table with the services that you're providing. Um, so we did have another question um, about a sample one-pager, um, so hopefully that, that answers everyone's questions about that. Okay, so very often uh, we don't know outcomes like ER usage and hospital admissions when people are referred to us for HCBS. Is there any way that you suggest to get, um, to get those outcomes? Can we ask managed care organizations? Well, I know that, uh, you know, just I know that psyches uh, can provide you with some of that uh, information. And I think it's also legitimate to rely on, you know, asking the people when they come in, you know. I mean, I know that it's not as uh, sort of uh, foolproof in terms of, you know, having the exact facts, but it's still, you can still get information from individuals by just asking them, how many times did you go to the emergency room in the last 30 days or in the last 60 days? Uh, how many times are you in the hospital? Were you admitted? How many days were you in the hospital? I think people are fairly reliable in giving you that information. But I think psyches also, I know not everybody has access to psyches, uh, but I also think that OMH is, is trying to make uh, some of that information uh, more available. Although I will say that you do need consent from the persons who your, um, whose information is, it is, who belongs to. So. Uh, but those are two places. Managed care organizations, um, you know, I don't know are, are, uh, are going to be available to give you that information, although you never know. Well, what I was thinking actually is that um, if someone is receiving HCBS, then they're enrolled in HARP, and they also have a HARP care manager from their managed care organization. So that may be another avenue um, to sort of Try to discover when you're when you're trying to get that information. Yeah, could you, uh, okay, Daniela, could you could you elaborate on that for the folks? Because this this idea, I don't know that everybody knows that somebody 
who is HARP eligible, has a HARP care manager at the MCO. So if someone's enrolled in a, in a health and recovery plan, they're receiving HCBS services, um, they do have another layer of support, and that's having a care manager through the managed care organization. And you'll find that those folks um, at that managed care organization really do try to be involved in, in the person's um, total care. So they may reach out if someone's, you know, already going to a clinic, they may, may reach out to that clinic provider or pros program provider and definitely HCBS provider. Um, and that's part of like the whole um, system of collaboration around caring, you know, making sure that that person is receiving the services that, that they need to receive and want to receive. Um, the other thing to sort of think about when we're answering this question is that, you know, when you're providing HCBS services, I don't know how necessarily important it is to know about um, how many hospital admissions or ER admissions um, someone has had. I think it's important to focus on the services that you're providing um, for that person and then looking at, you know, now that that person's engaged in HCBS, is that person going to the emergency room? So sort of like past history of emergency room and hospital utilization I don't think is as important as um, what happens going forward once that person starts to receive um, HCBS. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, you know, keep in mind that there are a lot, you know, when we talk about ER use and using that as a measure, there are a lot of factors that go into uh, a person going to the ER or a person going into the hospital. and. You know, one provider generally uh, providing a distinct service uh, is not going to be responsible entirely because there are so many, there may be so many other providers in the picture, there may be so many other services that the person is receiving. So, you know, on some level, you know, I think Danielle's words are, are worth heeding. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, if you're a housing provider, uh, you know, you may you may want to be able to you may want that information, especially if the person you know is coming from a shelter. Uh, you may want to you may want that baseline information uh, about ER and hospital use. Although, again, keep in mind that there are a lot of factors that contribute to a person's use of the ER, or that contribute to a person's needing to be hospitalized. Okay, so we have some more questions, so I'm going to move on. Um, the next question is, do you have a formula for determining a cost of service? Well, you know, uh, do, do we have a formula? You know, I think that you need to, my, my response to that is there are probably a number of formulas out there. What, you, if you have a finance department, uh, and finance people, I think it's a good idea for the program people and the finance people to sit down together and uh, to figure out um, what the formula for your organization is. You have to take into account not only the direct cost of service of that service, but also your overhead costs. And there are two levels of overhead costs that to consider: there's the program overhead, uh, and then there's the agency overhead. And uh, that has to be factored into uh, the unit cost. Uh, I'm not uh, going to pretend to be an expert in this area, but uh, I think that uh, it is logical. There's, there's a logic to it. And I think finance people are probably the, the best people to kind of consult around, um, around doing this. And, and doing it in a way where, you know, you can have a, a, a model that then you can plug numbers into and, and come up with, with unit costs for more than, you know, for all the services you provide. Okay. So let's move on. We have several more questions. Um, so the next one is, actually this one is an easy one for me to answer. Would you be able to have these sessions more than once um, at a location because sometimes it's not possible to attend what's scheduled? Um, so yes, we actually are offering uh, morning and afternoon sessions in each of the cities with the exception of New York City and Long Island. Um, and then we will also be posting um, the PowerPoints from that, um, from those workshops on the MCTAC site. And then you can also reach out to us. You can reach out to me definitely um, 
individually and we can sort of, you know, maybe get some learning communities together and do some other workshops um, if, you know, if folks are interested and, and there is a need. Okay, uh, here's a question about IPAs. So would you work with an IPA informing its value proposition instead of individual agencies at the workshops? <laughs> Eve, do you want to well, take that one? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, the people coming to the workshops will, will be, I mean, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. It will be representatives of the IPA, right? The IPA will consist of a number. Yeah, we can, we, it, it, you know, as I'm thinking about it, you know, that may be a more complex because then you'd have to integrate uh, in a value proposition for an IPA, you'd have to integrate all the services, the outcomes, and everything of a number of entities. Uh, and I think that may take more time. So I, I hesitate yeah. to say yes. Yeah, I don't think we'd be able to do that at these workshops. I think that's another uh, another possibility of doing something else uh, for 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 IPAs, and we'd have to kind of take that back and think about it a little bit and see if we can if we can answer that request. Yeah, I feel like working with an IPA to develop a value proposition, maybe sort of like the next level of workshop. Um, you know, these workshops really are for providers um, that need some help identifying their value and then putting that that value on paper. So I feel like working with an IPA um, in that respect is a, is a little bit next level, would you say? Yeah, I think we have to sit down with all the members uh, of that IPA and, and really hone right. this out. And that's the only way I could see, I could see between that, and that's a very different kind of, of, uh, of, of you know, of consultation. Right, exactly. Um, so this, I think, is a question that came in following the cost formula question. Um, the cost of service formula problem exists across SIP systems. This question um, about a formula has been floated numerous times, and no one seems to be able to come up with any formula. When will there be an answer to this question? So I think that we understand your frustration, um, but yes. it certainly is a difficult question to answer, right? Yeah. You know, yes, it's a difficult question to answer, and uh, I, I, but I think, and I, I, I kind of hear the frustration, and I, I also have to say that uh, I don't know that there is uh, a single, a single formula. I know that that doesn't make sense because there should be, because you know, all organizations are not that different from one another. They all have overhead costs and program, uh, and all of that. But I, I would, you know. A couple of times when I asked the question, I was told that um, people were working on it, uh, and you know, and that's the answer that I get. I, I wish, I wish that I could, I could give you more right now. But what I can tell you is that it's not. I don't think that uh, it's something that you can't figure out by yourself for your own organization if you get the right people in the room. I think you can figure it out. Uh, it's just that you need to have uh, the right people uh, who are kind of savvy in, in terms of how to distribute costs and distribute overhead costs uh, across programs and then uh, whittle it down to particular service uh, costs. I think it's doable if you don't want to wait until whoever it is that's going to come up with this. I think you could, I think you could come figure it out or come pretty close. Uh, to what your unit costs might be. And I think this might be an area where talking to friends, and again, you know, we always tend to stress collaboration, um, but talking to other providers in your area, folks that you're friends with, um, talk to them, see what they're doing, see how they're trying to cost out their services. Um, they may have a level of expertise that you might not have or know someone who has a level of expertise that you both don't have um, and use those resources together. So that's just one other suggestion. Um, there is a question, where in New York City um, 
will the workshop be held? And that's a very easy one to answer. So that is going to be at the Coalition of Behavioral Health Agencies, and that's uh, downtown in New York City on uh, William Street. Okay, I think, I'm just double checking, I'm not sure, I'm just making sure that we've covered everything. Um, Oh, here's one. Uh, so the challenge with cost is that so much is dictated by either an HMO or OMH or other governing body. Um, so funding streams usually dictate how we really receive money. And I, I think, yes, that's true. Um, so there is that sort of finite pool Right, but you're of money not going – yeah, you're not going to figure out your unit cost based on what you what you've been paid up to now. You know, because we all know that, uh, you know, the rates in general uh, as they exist, as they have existed, you know, have not ultimately paid for the services that, that uh, CBOs provide. Uh, so you have to kind of start from scratch and really figure out what does it cost you to deliver a service, the real cost. Uh, right. Because, you know, once the state does uh, sort of, pull back and, and uh, doesn't uh, control rates any longer, it's going to be up to individuals and groups and partnerships and, merge, you know, uh, IPAs uh, to figure out uh, what the real costs are uh, and then negotiate uh, with the managed care organizations around rates. So, um, I, you know, I, would, I wouldn't go by, uh, you know, what's been. I would go by what is, what is real. Uh, you know, rather than rather than than going by rates or or by structures that really weren't a real. So we have one more question, and it is one o'clock. But I do this is a good question, um, or they're all good questions. But I do want to be sure oh. to answer this one. So who should these value propositions be directed towards? Managed care organizations, potential partners in a BHCC. Um, please explain. I think all of the above. You're going yeah. to look. What you're trying to do here is this is going to be your sort of your mark. In a way, it's a marketing strategy, right? And you're going to be marketing your value to different entities uh, for different reasons. So, uh, you know, for the managed care organizations, when you sit down and when you engage with them, you want to give them something that uh, that that puts value or that describes your value in terms that are meaningful that is meaningful to them. Uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with partners, uh, you're doing that, the same thing, but again, you know, partners may, may be interested in slightly different things. Uh, and even when you're dealing with, uh, you know, communities, uh, when you're dealing with uh, consumers, uh, when you're dealing with anyone, you want to have a way of defining your value and expressing your value uh, in language and in a, mean, in, a, in a meaningful way for them. And I think I gave an example in the webinar that, you know, what's, you know, what's meaningful to your consumers and your value to consumers is not only that they're going to get services, uh, but that they're going to also get a lot of, that, that what's important to them is that, that whatever services they receive, those services are respectful and, 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 and safe. Uh, so that value to a consumer uh, to managed care organizations, it may be, you know, reduction e in ER and hospitalization. Uh, and to partners, you know, it may be that you have a workforce that's, um, that's well-trained and that you employ best practices. So uh, it's going to be different things for different folks. And on that note, we are over time, so I want to thank everyone for participating today and asking some really great questions. And I want to thank you, Eve, for joining us and sharing your wisdom. And we do hope that you will uh, register for the in-person workshops. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send an email over to uh, at mctac.info at nyu.edu, um, and then they'll forward those questions along to us. All right, so thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.